I don't know why I started cracking up. Welcome to the Michelle Mission, Two Men, One Podcast. Every black film ever made. My name is Len, a.k.a. the Bat Triple. Hello. And as always, I'm joined by my partner. Hey, what's going on? This is Vincent Williams. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we are here on a very special Monday evening mm. to bring you the next installment of the Michelle Mission. It is Vincent's selection as we dip into that magical movie year of 1989 for oh. a independent film. It is Wendell B. Harris Jr.'s Chameleon Street. Chameleon Street. Brought to you straight from the Criterion Collection. Ooh, la la. <laughs> Ça sent. Mm-hmm. here on the me show mission but first a shout out to each and every one of you who are out there watching us as we are streaming live on via Streamyard into facebook youtube as well as twitch and linkedin Ooh, for the business-minded viewer yes for the professional in you <laughs> And for those who are racing to your computers, you're like, they're on on a Monday? I know. What's going on? I know. They missed the notice. What's going on, Len? Are we, are we, how much inside baseball are we telling? Her? Well, you know, let's give them a peek behind the curtain. Okay, all right. Um, we are recording our show tonight on Monday because tomorrow night, mm. Tuesday, which is our regular regular recording evening, Vincent and I and our significant others will be taking in a very special screening of Jordan Peele's Nope. Yes, sir. And not trying to big time you or anything, yes, but sir, we got invited to a screening. And yes, sir. We're going to go check it out. Yes, sir. Really looking forward to that. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I am as well. So that promises to be a good time. So And we felt that that was a movie that warranted, if schedules allowed, for us to kind of switch some things up. Right, right. We didn't move things around for a screening of Lethal Weapon 2 down at the bar where someone set up a VCR. I have a funny feeling, though. I'm (laughs) too. If that was the case, I might have gotten a frantic text from someone i'm not saying who <laughs> like people are asking us for programming ideas <laughs> maybe we should pitch that <laughs> you know what would be really really nice if you want to draw them in we should host a screening of lethal weapon 2 mm-hmm. yeah, yeah at your bar yeah right right or movie house or movie house or university shoot us an email folks if you want lynn and i to host a screening of Lethal Weapon 2. I'm afraid of the <laughs> academic <laughs> curriculum that could fit in a screening of Lethal Weapon 2 and justify that. I will be pulling my kids out of that school <gasps> so fast. Is Lethal, is that the one with the drive through where they F you at the drive through or is that Lethal Weapon 3? I think that's 3. That's 3. Yeah. Because that's the one I quote the most. Mm. And yet you want us to review. <laughs> and yet two. I want us. Well, you know, I think we could talk about two and how two sets up. Oh. Oh. They so, F you at the drive through So we're going to do a prequel. A prequel. To the actual to movie. To the that actual we want. movie. There you go. Okay. All there right. you go. Yeah. You, you keep you keep workshopping that, Vince. But nevertheless, <laughs> we're going to see Nope. <laughs> yes, we are going to go see Nope. Uh, shout out to everyone out there in the chat. Hello, 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 Deborah Battle, uh, Aaron Fry, uh, your brother, not mine, but he feels like mine, mm-hmm. Damon Williams. Right, right. Uh, and, and as always, the loyal Miss Makiba. Right. And thank you. Thank you all for, for moving your schedule around. We appreciate that. We do. All right. So without any further ado, since you have joined us, we are going to get right into the show. We're going to start with listener mail. Ah, missives from missionaries. We got a couple of emails, Vincent. Okay. The first one we received is from Maddie Gutierrez. Hey, Maddie. Hello, Vincent and Len. I'm a student and history buff. Oh, 
Okay. And have been learning a lot about the Civil War all summer, especially on the 54th Regiment and other Black regiments involved. Nice. I was doing research on Colonel Shaw and watched the film Glory. Oh, okay. Although a lot different from what I read in his letters, he mentioned Charlotte Fortin, and it was until wasn't until recently I found out Fortin was in glory, but cut due to pacing and the director's decision. That's right. Well, the point is, I was really hoping to hear the recent podcast with Carla Brothers to speak of her experience in glory because Carla Brothers actually um, portrayed um, Charlotte Fortin. That's right. In the film. But it was, as she mentioned, cut from the movie. Shaw and Fortin did have a close bond, and it would have been great to see see it on the big screen, but understandably the film's focus is on the 54th. I was hoping if any news on this brothers would be, uh, when she would be back on the podcast in August, hopefully hear her stories working on the film and Mr. Broderick, thank you so much. And we'll tune in for the next episodes. You guys are great and keep doing what you're doing. Sincerely, Maddie. Oh, thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Maddie. We will certainly keep you abreast of when Carla brothers will be on the show. We are both Big fans, big time of, of Carla Brothers as we, an actress we, and as a person. So. Mm -hmm. And we are waiting to get her on to, to schedule her for August uh, to come on to the show. And she does have stories. She share. does have stories she, about she, her experience. She, she does have stories. Big time. We also heard from Belinda Silver. Hey, Belinda. Thank you for your program on black exploitation films. Hey, which you can find is a very recent episode, Sweetback's Bad Ass Universe. Yes, sir. A, a fun episode that we did with Josiah Howard. Yeah, another another good another good friend of the show. Mm -hmm. At seventy one, I have seen my share during the time of release. Well, God bless you. Amen. There was nothing like watching kids bouncing and rocking through the opening credits of Shaft mm. or on my first trip to New York that I had to go across 110th Street. Across 110th Street. <laughs> or seeing Sammy Davis Jr. introducing Isaac Kays in his bald glory at the Academy Awards performance for Best Song. Mm. There was so much smoke you could barely see anything. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in another show you can discuss the soundtracks. For me, the pinnacle is Superfly, which I've mm. heard playing on a beach in Thailand mm -hmm. and a wharf in New Zealand. Oh, oh. Well, Belinda Damn. gets around. Hey, Belinda sounds like a black exploitation hero. Yeah, we need to get Belinda on the show. I think you were taking down Mr. Big. Have you done a, a soundtrack show? If not, would you consider a discussion? If you have access to it, please see Neptune Frost, the movie from Rwanda by a uh, Rwandan. Okay. Yes, we actually talked about. Yeah, Neptune I was about Frost. to say that's very much on our radar. Yeah, it was one of the, the one of the films that we had highlighted mm -hmm. as a, a film to look uh, forward to. Right, looking forward to. Yeah, coming out this summer. So. Yes, sir. Uh, it was so unique that I'm still baffled. Love your show, and you provide information and lots of laughter. Belinda. Thank you, Belinda. This is actually, last week, I think, was the third, the 50th anniversary of Superfly. Oh, one of, one of the stations, one of the local stations here in Philadelphia played the whole the whole album. Mm. And it was, it. I don't know the last time you've listened to Superfly from beginning to end, but it is a striking piece of music. Oh, I can believe when it. you hear it in totality. So I definitely can believe that, man. Yeah, it's a uh, wow, 50 years. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Which actually brought to mind um, our, our, excuse me, social media okay. uh, representative, Toya. Hey, Toya. She has sent over a text to me, and uh, excuse me, a, a posting from Instagram from Essence um, about. The year 2002. Okay. For many millennials, 2002 feels more like five years ago than 20. But believe it or not, several of the movies that captured and defined black culture in the early aughts are turning 20 this year, oh, this reaching true depressing. classic film status. From hood classics starring your favorite rappers to love stories that shaped how our young minds viewed relationships, these films stayed in heavy rotation in our DVD players and often on cable television providers for years after their initial release and may 
even remain there to this day. And some of these films, it's hard to imagine, but they actually 20 years old. This is about to be so crushing. What is Queen of the Damned? Oh, starring um, Aaliyah. Aaliyah. Yeah. John Q. Oh, with Denzel Washington. Right. Friday after next. (laughs) The third, the the second sequel to Friday is 20 years old. Right. How about that? Um, What else is here? Uh, Brown Sugar. Brown Sugar is that that actually feels right. Drumline. I, it's hard to imagine wow. drumline is 20 years old drumline is 20 years old barbershop is 20 years old okay well barbershop feels kind of timeless antoine fisher oh boy it's crazy man right you know why drumline feels so old, old? because despite and i guess he certainly has lived a life yeah Nick Cannon still feels like he's the young guy I at the party. No, you know what I, I mean? No, like how did Nick Cannon make a movie 20 years ago? Right? Yeah. It's crazy, yeah. though. But that's crazy. That's yeah. that's absolutely crazy, man. That's what you know, look, time don't stop. Right, right. I mean, the bad thing is you're saying things like Antoine Fisher and John Q, like like, like minor entries on Denzel Washington's mm-hmm. filmography. Yeah, are twenty years old. Right. Yeah. Right. It's crazy. Right. That's so. That's that's really shout cool. out to Derek Luke though. Introduces Derek Luke, Antoine Fisher. That's true. Yeah. So and Drumline is probably the movie that put Zoe Saldana. No. Well, Nick Cannon put. Nick oh, well, definitely on Nick on, Cannon. On, yeah. On the map. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So pretty cool. All right. Uh, let's go to a, a couple of uh interesting tidbits that were shared with our Facebook group. Okay. Did you hear the story, Vincent, about the cartoonist Rob Armstrong, uh, the creator of the the uh, comic strip Jumpstart, and his connection to Peanuts? I did Charles not. Charles Schultz. Um, this shared in our Facebook group, and it's from Newsweek. Mm-hmm. He kept this, Rob Armstrong, he kept this secret for 13 years. He is the cartoonist behind Jumpstart. He received a phone call one day in 1994 mm-hmm. from his friend, Peanuts creator, Charles Schultz, who was working on a new special. You're in the Super Bowl, Charlie Brown, and realized that he was in, his words, a pickle. Mm. There's a portion of the footage where Charlie Brown and all his friends are being announced over a PA system. And as the announcer announces each um, member, they come running out onto the field. Of course. And so coming onto the field, you have Charlie Brown, Linus Van Pelt, and Lucy, everyone. Right, Lucy Van Pelt. Right. Peppermint. And peppermint Patties. Patties. Whatever. I wonder what her last name is. Is her last name Patty? I don't think that's her last name, but I, th- I feel like she she has been given a last name. Okay, but then it comes to the point when Franklin, you know the 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 the, the black kid, the black kid, yes, 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 is has to run out. Okay, and that's when Schultz realized that the character had been done a great disservice, that he had never given Franklin a last name. Wow, and so he was calling Rob, mm-hmm. his friend. Would he allow um, uh, Charles Schultz to give Franklin his last name? Wow. And so that Franklin's last name was to be then and forevermore Armstrong. That is fantastic. So he's Franklin Armstrong. And this was a secret that Rob not only kept, he did not, he didn't make a big deal about it. He didn't tell his syndicate. Uh, He didn't tell his wife. He actually didn't share the story uh, until he did a show, excuse me, a a speech at the Schultz Museum in 2007, at at which time afterward, Jeannie Schultz, a Charles widow, came up to him shocked and asked why he never told her. And Rob said, I still don't know why I never told her or anybody else. Honestly, I was just flattered and I wanted to be modest like him. So I said, Oh, don't you think it would have seemed a little unseemly if I was running around tapping people on the shoulder to tell them that? And she says, what are you talking about? This is enormous news. And she embraced the story. Armstrong credits Jeannie was spreading the story because even then he never really spread the story. Sure, sure. It's a great story. It's a great story. It's It's an amazing story. story about the shared bond between these 
to cartoonists. Yeah. And Rob Armstrong would use this as fuel for the Armstrong project named for both Rob and Franklin, mm -hmm. which has been set up um, to provide $100,000 endowments at both Howard and Hampton universities um, to get um, black kids to increase, to see about increasing the demographics of the animation industry. Yeah. Yeah. And jumpstart was, is a great cartoon strip. Too. It is like, it like is. it, and it has that kind of gentle energy mm -hmm. of peanuts. So I actually didn't know that Rob Armstrong and Charles Schultz were friends, but it makes perfect sense. It does. So yeah, that's a great story. That's pretty dope. Yeah. That is actually pretty dope. And uh, thank you for sharing that in our Facebook group. We also got a, a story that was shared. I don't know how you feel about this, Vince. Oh, boy. Something tells me you don't feel any type of way. All right. About who is going to be the director of the next installment of the Captain America film franchise. Oh, yeah. And now this yeah, one yeah, is yeah. going to be starring uh, Anthony Mackie. Yeah. Yeah, I actually feel good role. about this. The fourth entry is mm -hmm. going to be directed by Julius Ona. Yes. A Nigerian-American filmmaker who is more famously known for the Cloverfield Paradox and the social thriller Louche. Yes. Uh, L-U-C-E. I may miss yes. pronouncing that. Um, he, he also co-wrote uh, Samos Lives, a biopic about the life of Jean-Michel Basquiat. Um, he has been tapped, according to The Hollywood Reporter, to direct the fourth installment of the Captain America film franchise. What do you think about that, Vince? I'm happy. Yeah. I, I'm happy about this. I I, I think I'm, I'm happy he's gotten a tap. Mm -hmm. You know? Like, like I'm, I'm happy that there is a, a wave of Black directors that it seems are getting opportunities yeah instead of you know putting it in the in the queue and waiting for jordan peele or somebody to be free. or ryan coogler or ryan coogler to be free so yeah very happy about this. this well that's one of the things i i will have to say about um marvel as they are now in i guess what phase four yeah the, i think they're calling it phase four of, of their films is that they have tried to be a little different in some of their directing directorial choices. Yes. Recently, you yes. know, a little, a little adventurous. I, yeah. I, I got to uh, admit that man. Um, because I'm thinking about while he certainly is not a new name, but it is, deemed as refreshing for them to have tapped Sam Raimi to do the Doctor Strange movie. Right. Um, they tapped uh, Chloe Zhao for the Eternals mm -hmm. film. That's right. Which I didn't 100% like agree with, but I appreciated what it was trying to I, do. I very much appreciated that it was different. And, and look, man, at this point, you and I got on a tangent about this yesterday when we were working on something. Look, these movies are coming out every six months. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it's almost at the point we're judging a Marvel movie on its own merits. You're almost looking at it wrong. Like at this point, they're all just pieces mm. of this giant mosaic. Mm -hmm. So they have the luxury to try to do different things. Like macaroni and cheese is my favorite part of Thanksgiving dinner, but I don't want non-different macaroni and cheeses. So, so like I'm not a friend, I'm not a fan of you know, like I don't know the, the, the yams with the marshmallows on top, but but like so I know, I know, I know, I don't want to, I know it's very controversial, I know, but some people like that, mm. so. It, that should be on the table too. So, like you said, you have these different directors doing different things. I like how, again, they're bringing some of these younger directors, giving them a tap. Our girl is directing the Captain Marvel sequel, The Marvels. Oh, um, I, 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 I right, right. Her name just flew out my mind. I know. I wish you had, I know that you were going there. Uh, Hold on, I will tell you in a second. The Marvel's film is set to be directed 
Bye. Here we go. Here we go. It's going to start. Uh, wow. What, who, where is the director? Here we go. Nia DaCosta. Nia DaCosta. Yes. Nia uh, DaCosta. So I think last seen on Candyman. Was right. Last right. Movie? Right. And we've been fans of since Little Woods. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So I love it. So, yeah, I'm very happy for Julius. Oh, nah. Yeah. 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 Very happy and looking forward to this. Yeah, I'm looking forward to to that as well. It's interesting that you talk about how to judge these Marvel films on their own is maybe not even the right way to do this. Um, Robert Monroe Jr. pipes in with uh, a little bit of a rumor. There's a rumor that Shamir Anderson will be appearing as Blue Marvel in the Marvels movie. It would not surprise me. It would not surprise me. I think... I think Marvel has very much had a commitment to the deep cut at this point. Mm -hmm. I have a friend, we all joke about how much Marvel flexes at this point. Like the Eternals had a movie, which is like second wave 70s throwaway Jack Kirby that ideas is, yeah. at this point. Yeah. But, you know, at this, it, look, again, we can. So it would not surprise me if Blue Marvel showed up. Me, me neither. Because why not? Why not? Um, so, yeah, so I was talking about, like, you were saying, you know, some of the, to judge these films on their own is maybe not the right way to do it. And yet, I recently joined, well, I didn't go with you, but now we both have watched and seen Thor, Love and Thunder. Yes, sure. I saw that film um, uh, a couple of days ago, and... I just got to tell you that is that 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 Thor Love and Thunder is not a good movie. It is it is not it is it feels as if they were writing that movie as they were going along mm -hmm. as they were making it. I think that it is an ugly film. I mm -hmm. think some of the CG looks horrible in that film. Um I think that film wastes, totally wastes a fantastic performance by Christian Bale. Mm -hmm. He is in a totally another mo different movie and he des needs, deserves to be in another movie because he is great in the movie from the beginning all the way to the end. You f you ride the roller coaster of emotions with him, but that's Christian Bale. He He leaves it all on the screen. Everything else in this film, I just felt was really just, just, just really just bad, just bad. Tessa Thompson, who I love, we love her here. She is absolutely looks bored throughout the entire film. Like she cannot wait for this to, to be over. Um, I think Taika Waititi is on cruise control on this film and probably so because when you read the man's imdb he has his his fingers in at least about 12 different things all at the same time right now so he's being stretched like like crazy um there's a love triangle between thor and two hammers that okay it's kind of i see where you're going with it but it is overplayed so much and runs congruent with the tone that the bad guy is setting up in this film, that the two tones just bash uh, heads against one another. And it just 100% doesn't work. And I was thoroughly bored and did not enjoy this film. Wow, you thought about Thor Love and Thunder way more than it warranted. I got a big thing of popcorn. And I sat and and watched it, and then it was over. And now it's going to be another one of these Marvel movies in six months. See how that works? You don't like this one? It's another one coming out in six months. I tried to do that. I mean, you know, I don't know what you want from the thirty nine thousand Marvel movie. <laughs> I wanted it something halfway decent. I mean. It's, you know, that was decent enough. Nah, I didn't think it was. I, right. thought, I thought it was ugly and just badly made. Yeah, all right. Badly made. You know what? There you go. I tried to let this go. Oh, forget. But I knew that your comment 
about Thanksgiving was going to get them popping in. I know. Look. The, about, about you know, know, it's about, about the sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes and yams. I know. I know. And you know who had to chime in? It may have been my brother. You're right. Yeah, your brother. Okay. Damon, the Thanksgiving table is valuable real estate. Yams with marshmallows shouldn't make the cut. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, doesn't he share a Thanksgiving table with you? Or do Yeah. You oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but do do they not make the cut on your edge? I mean, they, they show up. Who makes them? It's obviously somebody's look, bringing them. Uh, look, Somebody uh, just somebody's bringing them. Look, yeah, somebody's bringing them. And quite frankly, I don't pay attention to it. Okay. I don't really care about them yams. All right. You know. But is it one of those things where they show up and then the person is, you know, sheepishly taking the whole no, dish home? No, no. Pe people like yams. Okay. People love yams. I don't know about yams with marshmallows. I mean, the sweet potato. What is it? Yams or sweet potatoes? Well, it's the same. Right. You know, people love that. I don't want it. But the table ain't just for me. That's why it's a lot of stuff on the table. Uh, I'm really invested in who made the macaroni and cheese. Like, yes. like that's like, well, okay. Who made the macaroni and cheese? Okay, so that because that determines whether or not you're going to eat. Well, that really does set the tone. Okay, like that is the the pass fail. Okay, of Thanksgiving dinner. I like turkey. I know it's real hip to say, oh, I don't like turkey at Thanksgiving dinner, but I actually enjoy turkey. I think a well prepared turkey is delicious. I like turkey wings and the drumstick. If I don't get anything else, I don't eat turkey. I know. I like I, I, if you make a turkey breast right. I love turkey, and most people overcook it. Yeah, obviously, yeah. But you know, I, I love I, I love turkey. I love you know string beans. I like good string bean casserole. You know, I actually I'm, love stuffing. Well, we've we've had our yes, stuffing, today. yes, but, but but you know, again, my point is. Is so much stuff on the table. You, you know, people like ham. I don't mess with that pig. Right, you don't eat pork. I ain't mess with no pig since I was probably 18. But you know, people enjoy ham. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, know, you have a ham on the table. My wife's people fry chicken. I'm never turned down no fried chicken. Turn down the you know, there's some fried chicken around. But again, it's, you know, whether you talk about- Where are about you with cranberry sauce? I don't like cranberry sauce. Me neither. No, I don't like cranberry sauce. But- People love cranberry sauce. I don't know those people. I, th I think I, I think a Thanksgiving table is not complete without cranberry sauce on the table. So you need to see it there. I, I need it. To, it needs to be on the table. And, and again, if there are 30 people in the room and two people like cranberry sauce, I think that you should have, a cran have the cranberry sauce. On. Yeah, I agree. Right. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> Shit, now I'm on Thanksgiving dinner and it's only July. <laughs> Well, what you could do is you can have a dinner planning out the menu for Thanksgiving. Yeah, have the so that way you can figure out, all right, we want to bring like three three macaroni and cheeses to right. decide, determine who's going to make right, the right, macaroni right. and cheese. Right, right. You know, right. Right. Exactly. have a tournament. Have a tournament. Have a tournament. I'm actually a fan of Thanksgiving dinner. The day. Like, I actually like the leftovers. Well, everybody the likes the leftovers. Day. Well, you know, it's some people get real funky with leftovers. You never met like these funky people that I don't eat leftovers. No, I do know some people that don't. Right, eat right, right. Like it's some people get real funky with leftovers, but I love yeah. leftovers. Yeah, I like leftovers. Yeah. I see. I don't. I don't like people who bring home leftovers, knowing that they're not going to eat the leftovers. Oh, well, that's just terrible. So now that's just terrible. You just have formaldehyde growing yeah, in your yeah, refrigerator. That's just terrible. Yeah, right, right, and right. That, those are the people that right get on my nerves. Right. It's the old saying again. My, my wife's people take all you want, but eat all you take. Amen. So you know. that's right. Uh, Miss McKeeba says that Damon uh, to your brother and to us, uh, sweet potatoes with butter, brown sugar, sprinkled, and cinnamon. That's the only mm -hmm. way to eat. You know, I don't really like sweet potatoes unless like they're potatoes. unless they're in a pie. Like yeah, a lot of people pie. like them in pie form. Right. I don't like sweet potatoes at all. And even that, like I can count in terms on, of who I can count on like one hand whose people sweet potato pie I mess with. Okay. Because you know that's it's real easy to mess up a sweet potato pie. I would never find out. Okay. Because I don't mess. Not with your it. thing. No. That's fair. It's. I don't a taste. like sweet potatoes. I don't like sweet potato fries. I don't like sweet potatoes. That's fair. That's okay. fair. You know, it's a taste. There you go. All right. Mm -hmm. You ain't like Thor Love and Thunder. Don't worry. They're gonna churn out another one in six months. I think I think we might be up. 
Like I think Wakanda Forever is next. It's is that, scheduled? Is, is it, it's scheduled to be. Uh, is it that uh, or Ant Man? Like what's next? No, it, I believe it is Wakanda Forever because that's scheduled for November. Okay, there you go. So we're up next. So hopefully the macaroni and cheese is next. We'll see. Hopefully, uh, apparently there was a leak of some some footage from Black Panther that made it out there. I don't look at leaked footage. Me either, because Me either. I don't think I think usually you're not looking at it certainly in any type of finished sure. way. Sure. Um, and I think that does a disservice to the artists that are creating that. Sure. So. I I am assuming that there will be a trailer at Comic-Con. Which is this weekend, right? Yeah. Is it this weekend or next weekend? It like might it. be this weekend. I feel like it's this weekend. It's this weekend. Yeah. yeah. This weekend. I, I have a strong feeling. Probably like a teaser. We're going to get a trailer at Comic-Con. Yeah. So. Yeah. I feel like that. Or because... Comic Con is this weekend, and then doesn't usually like Disney twenty three. I was about to say, I know D twenty three is coming out, and it's going to be follows some stuff. right on the heels. Yeah, of that. and and like lately they've been like you know, oh yeah, they Disney got their own stuff. I was about to say Disney's not <laughs> playing with y'all. Disney's <laughs> like, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, between this weekend and whenever the Disney thing is, I feel like a trailer is coming. It will be coming. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I think it's going to be a trailer that is going to be like I said, a teaser that's going to like give you the visuals and. Still not give you a hint of the story. Look, man. Which is cool. I don't mind. My favorite trailers of all time. Of course, now I can only think of two of them. I can't even do a list off the top of my head. Do you remember that first Matrix commercial from the Super Bowl? Yes. I seem to remember that. Blew my mind. Because doesn't that show the bullet time? That's the bullet time. And that's the one where Morpheus says, free your mind. And then jumps across. And Mm -hmm. I remember sitting and I said, what the hell is this? Everybody did. That was the people do not understand. The Matrix changed movies. And the first trailer for Black Panther. Like that mm. first, like that first quick trailer where they showed the car chase mm-hmm. and he flipped off the car and ran on the side of the building. That's not oh okay, that was black. That was, yeah, that was in the first trailer. See, and, I think Black Panther showing up in the Captain America trailer. Yeah, that's the one that was because that's the one where he comes rolling out of the car out of the tunnel. Yeah, and he's still running. Yeah, that was like, oh, yeah. oh what the what has just yeah. happened? So I, I have high hopes for the Wakanda Forever trailer. No pressure, Mr. Kugler and company. No pressure. No pressure whatsoever. OK, OK. But I did my rant. Yes. About Thor, Love and Thunder. Yes. So that we could get into this week's edition of Lens Top 5. Okay. And this week's edition is about the top five dumb superhero movies. Oh, boy. Now. Just five? Well, it's the top five. The top five. Okay. It's the top five. All right. Now, mind you, there are some bad superhero movies. Yes. But they're not necessarily dumb. Okay. Because maybe... Something just went left. You see what they were going for, something went left, or everybody was giving it their their all and it just didn't con you know come together. Sure. But it's not overall just a dumb experience. Right. Right. So there's gonna be someone here that you know people are gonna be complaining about and saying, Oh, what about this? What about that? Well, this first of all, this is my top five. It is, and I will explain why each is on this list. Okay? okay. What we got. So, so let's give them the intro music first for Lens Top Five. Top five. Who's your top five? My top five is. My top five is. All right. Okay. Starting with number five. Number five. On the the dumb superhero movies we have at number five Nick Fury Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> now <laughs> now I will admit this is five 
I will admit that this is a TV movie <laughs> from 1998. Starring David Hasselhoff. Starring David Hasselhoff <laughs> of Knight Rider and Baywatch fame <laughs> as one-eyed Nick Fury, agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. This was a TV movie that premiered on Fox, the Fox Network in 1998. <laughs> And there's no more to be said. <laughs> this was a dumb idea. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was dumb in its execution. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was dumb for David Hasselhoff, who starred in this film and was a producer. Mm. Because he wanted to do this. He wanted to do this. He yeah. wanted to bring this to the screen. Yeah. Passion project. Pa well, I, well, <laughs> I don't know if it was a passion project. Yeah. Maybe it was a fever dream. Oh. Maybe, maybe he was maybe he had a bad cold mm. and just couldn't get over it. Maybe it was the flu-induced, you know, trauma that maybe. made him want to do Nick. But it, it is so dumb. That I had to give it honorable mention here at number five. Okay, number okay, five. Even though it's a TV movie. All right. All right. Now we move to number four. Number four. Number four, the dumb superhero movies, is Judge Dredd Judge from 1995. Dredd. Right, right. The first of two Judge Dredd films. Well, the, the true. I mean, not, they're not connected. Right. They, the, and neither of them share. And yeah. the other one doesn't share the title. The other one is just Dread. Dread, right. Just with, Dread. With Carl Urban. Yeah. The 1995 <laughs> Judge Dread stars a badly casted Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. Especially because this is still Sylvester Stallone back when he believes he's matinee idol. Sylvester Stallone. Yeah, yeah. And comic book, book movies are kind of hot around mm -hmm. now. So he's trying to, you know, get in where he can fit Get's in. Some of that comic book money. So he does Judge Dredd. It's something different. It's mm -hmm. a British comic. You know, he's bringing it out there. Bringing it out there. Judge Dredd, who is a character who is still pretty popular in 1995. Yeah, oh yeah. And he's popular for being like, you know, rough and tumble and take, and take no prisoners. But the biggest aspect of judge dread is that you never see his face which is why which is why <laughs> sylvester stallone said oh that's not gonna do i mean i mean look man it's... so sylvester stallone is constantly out of his his helmet in this entire exercise of a film look it's it's it, every every one of these movies at some point they all had their masks off because I'm not paying George Clooney thirty five million dollars to have mm -hmm. half his face covered up. Half I mean you know you understand it, but well, you know also Judge Dredd is always one of my examples of how these projects work with superhero hero films mm -hmm. where no one who actually makes the decisions reads the source material yeah like they yeah. have an assistant who has an intern mm -hmm. who reads it because both this and carl urban i'm trying i'm not gonna get too nerdy but judge dread works because it's satire yes and both of these films play it straight and like you can see the point flying over everybody's head involved with both of them well see i i disagree in in, in one aspect Judge Dredd, as the comic book was famously made, definitely was satire, right? Yes. The Carl, the Carl Urban Dredd, the satire is, it's kind of there, but it definitely, you're, you're right. It's more mm -hmm. played straight. It's, it's, the tongue is not in the cheek in it. But I think it works because even without the satire, the tone of the film matches the tone of the comic book. I don't think it does. I I I I enjoyed I enjoyed Dread. Mm. The bad thing, Sylvester Stone, Stallone actually made a version of Judge Dread, which was Demolition Man. Exactly. Right. Like Demolition Man is actually Judge Dread. He should have just, just put the helmet on 
You have Judge Dredd. Which is why you confused the two films. Right. All right. But keep going because we not, we, we're not going to have a repeat of last week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Number three. Number three. The third dumbest superhero movie, according to Len. Yes. Is Suicide Squad from 2016. Now, this was dumb because this movie is a mess. Yeah, I don't even think it's dumb. Well, I think it's bad. Well, yes, it is bad. Yeah, it is bad. Um, the only thing this movie gets right is casting Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. Yes. Now they don't play her correctly no. in the film, and it wouldn't be until the um, Harley Quinn and the Birds of Prey movie, and then the Su- Suicide Squad soft reboot the yeah. suicide squad where margot robbie is actually able to play her, the character to our highest potential but casting her is smart one because i think she's a, a great actress and mm-hmm. she definitely fits the look her look the look that they put her in in this comic book is a little problematic but to be fair it is directly from the comics right it's the, again i'm not gonna get to Right. The Paul Dini perfect one. And then they. Yeah. But if you watch this film, this film is a, an absolute mess. It's a mess. It was taken out of the hands of the director and then given to these, these, um, these guys who make trailers to then edit this movie. And then the movie feels like it is a two hour trailer, yeah. more or less. There are weird juxtaposition, weird transitions. The, 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 the protagonist makes absolutely no sense and spends the the entire movie just waving her arms like this like crazy it is a, an absolute disgrace of uh, it, it it's i i can't stand that movie and and i'm not even touching on jared leto as joker look it's, yeah it's it's a film that's probably bad. like like at least demolition man and nick fury are kind of funny to talk about yeah yeah this is it, I'd actually forgotten this is this existed already. Well, then let's go on to number two. All right, thank you. The number two dumb superhero movie is Superman Returns. Oh boy, from two thousand six. Yeah. Now, I have a good friend. I know Randy Arson, the voice I of Randy know. from Gangsta Grass. I know. Beloved Superman fan, he still capes for this film. Oh my god, this film is dumb because this film which is supposed to be a sequel to superman 2 so you're supposed to totally just wipe from your mind superman 3 and 4 right okay fair enough i forgot about them i didn't put them on the list i'm going to the film that's supposed to make up for those films. This is supposed to be a direct sequel to Superman 2. Yet this film turns Superman into the most powerful stalker in the world. Yeah. This man hovers outside houses, looks in on children as they sleep. This man is um he he first of all he uh brandon routh who does not to me look like superman does not fill out the suit not a bad clark kent but does not fill out the suit um the machinations that this film goes through to make superman you know this almost pitiful character or uh, uh, made absolutely no sense. Lois Lane doesn't have any agency in this film, which is a total, total, um, you know, not to what Margot Kidder had built up in those two films. Uh, and then it, it, it just, it wastes the casting here. Um, Kevin Spacey problematic to talk about now. I actually don't think he's doing a bad job as Luthor, but he pales. He's, trying to mimic Gene Hackman's Luthor Mm -hmm. and he's never going to win that battle. You know, it's Gene Hackman. Yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I I just think that this was just an exercise in futility. This is another one that I successfully forgotten. 
I wish I yeah, I wish we could yeah. forget that this existed. Yeah. Um, but we can't. And now the number one number Dunn's Dom superhero film. Okay, what we got from 2015, Fantastic yeah. Four. Another film that you forgot all about, right? I've actually never seen it. You've never seen it? I've never seen it. Well, as a lifelong Fantastic Four fan, I felt obligated to see this film. I'm a and I'm a huge fan of Miles Teller. Mm-hmm. Um, and this film kind of like takes the the ultimate Fantastic Four mm-hmm. comic book and kind of brings that to life where the 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 team are younger, younger. Sure, of course. Um and has a totally different relationship with Victor Von Doom, who will become Dr. Doom. But again, this is a movie that is just ridiculous. It is absolutely ridiculous. And the special effects in the film are look like this is from 2015. These special effects look like they are from 1975. Mm-hmm. And it's a shame because I like, uh, who was that? Josh Trank? Josh Trank. Yeah. Because I liked um, um, Chronicle. I like Chronicle a lot. Yeah. And, and the, which is yeah. why people were excited about this. Yeah. And now there's some, I, I believe the story is that maybe the, the studio some got, set stuff. And, some yeah. set stuff. He, yeah. he, he got, yeah. didn't get along with the cast or what have you. Um, I didn't think the cast was bad. You know, My, Miles Teller, we like um, Michael B. Jordan. The cast is Johnny Storm. Okay. It's kind of original, mm-hmm. um, but they don't really do anything with it. Sure, um, it's it, it's just a film that is an, an absolute mess, an absolute mess, and a dumb, dumb superhero film. And to my mind, the dumbest of the superhero movies, and probably because it just it leads to Fantastic Four. Right, right, I'm, right. I'm begging for a good Fantastic well, Four. Well, speaking movie. of Comic Con and D twenty three, I suspect you're going to have some good news in the next couple of weeks. Uh, well, I hope so. Because I feel like they'll be making that that announcement too. I I, I, I do hope so. Now I do hope so. It's back in the loving hands of the Marvel machine. Uh, Robert Monroe Jr. says in regards to Suicide Squad, my daughter left Suicide Squad thinking that we should send the studio a bill for our time <laughs> wasted. She's not wrong. She's not wrong. She's not wrong at all. Yeah. Uh, and also saw that. Um, where was it? Uh, Aaron Fry said, "Are you counting TV movies? Then you must count Captain America and the Doctor Strange film. Both of these films from the seventies. You know, I have a little bit of affection for those TV. Marvel Which movies. ones? Both Doctor Strange and Captain America, as well as all of the Incredible Hulk movies. Wait a minute. Okay, wait a minute." Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'll give you the Incredible Hulk Hulk movies because they are sequels to the TV show, which is a beloved TV show. Yes, So I'll give you them, even though they're not that great. But it's because it's it's coming off that universe, you roll with it. Yes. The Doctor Strange movie is so bizarre. It is so freaking bizarre. Which means I love it. See how that works? No, I don't see how that works. It's it, super it, weird. Yeah, but it's it's not good. And low budget. I don't, oh, hey, hey. It's not. I, I didn't say it was good. When did I say it was good? Okay. I never said it was good. Okay. I said I had affection for it. You got affection for it. Yeah, like it was just kind of low. You sure you don't mean an infection? Yes. This kind of low budget, they kind of threw somebody $30 and they made it and... You say what you want. That Captain America motorcycle. Oh no! And the Captain America helmet. No, I think the design still works. No, no, no. I think no. Captain America on no. a motorcycle. Did they ever show Captain America on a motorcycle before the Captain America movie in the seventies? Not like that. No, 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 no. no he no. was on a motorcycle before that, but did, he would just be in his costume. When did he ride up? And then we we not go. Here's our project. Here's me and Lynn's project okay. after the show. I don't think Captain America was depicted as a motorcycle dude. 
before the Captain America TV movie. I'm telling you, he was. I can tell you, Vince, he was in The Invaders, but he was just in his costume. Yeah, but was he a motorcycle dude? Well, you didn't say motorcycle dude. You said I, show him no, on a no, motorcycle. No. Um, um, like, you know how now he's a motorcycle dude? Like, he just motorcycle dude. He like Tom Cruise. I don't think he's a motorcycle dude, but okay. All right. I he is you. very much always on a motorcycle. That costume. Man. No. The only reason. It I was, like it. No. The, you know why you like it? Why do I like it's it? It's because you're a kid of the 70s. Yes. So you see that, and it evokes the member berries Absolutely. of Evil Knievel. That is, that is 100% and Motorcycle correct. jumping. Yes. And the red, white, and blue. You keep saying it like oh, this. All that. These are not good reasons. Yeah, but if you look at it in just it, itself. It's horrible. I think it's an interesting design. It's absolutely horrible. I think the helmet is an interesting design with the with the painted on wings and the shield as the, the plexiglass shield. shield. I think it's an interesting. I think it's an interesting idea. Mm. So there you go. No, no. And then Rob, what's his name? Rob Wilson, who's the the who plays Captain America. I, 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 yeah, he's I robbed somebody. Say, he's, I don't remember like the name looks, of the actor who played Captain America. In the he TV looks movie. like he came. Like like tenth place in a surfer contest. Look, he's like he's absolute, horrible. It's horrible. I think both of them. I have affection for both. I, of them. No. I really do. When was the last time you saw them? It's been a minute. I mean, like two or three years. Like you know, you know, the stuff shows up on YouTube. Well, you must have been a you must have been drinking I'm while you watch them. I'm telling you, I have a certain. Do you, do you, do you that, bring them out on charcuterie that Fridays? Same affection that people have for the Spider Man television show. Which also was not good. Not good. At all. Horrible. But, you know, you have affection for it. Yeah. So, all right. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. That's my top five. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. What's next on the agenda? <laughs> Next on the agenda is, of course, everyone's favorite game, oh. Six Degrees of Durban. Right, right. You always want to do Six Degrees. Now my mind is, is <laughs> like I'm all, now I'm thinking about the Captain America TV movie. Now you want to do Six Degrees of Durville Martin. The shame is he was never in a movie, so I, I can't know. connect to him. I know. Was Gloria, so what, the sister's name on Spider-Man, was that Gloria, Gloria Gant, Glory? Like, remember, it was the sister on the on the television show. Yeah, was she in the comics after the television show? I think they put her in the comics after the television show because she more or less was playing the Betty Brand. Right, 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 right. So right. there, you, all right, all right. Go ahead. All right, all right, all right. All right. Six degrees of Durbin six degrees of Durbin. <laughs> All right, Six Degrees of Dervell Martin with Vincent has six movies or less to get from 70s action superhero Dervell <laughs> Martin to an actor of my choice. Are you ready, Vincent? I I'm, am ready. I've got an easy one and a hard one. Okay. Which one do you want first? I want the hard one. You want the hard one I first? I want the hard one. All right, and the six movies or less six get from Dervell Martin. Dervell Martin. To, to Claude Rains. Claude Rains. I don't even know that Claude Rains was in. Oh yes, you do. What would I know that he was in? He's just one of those names. He was in Casablanca. He was in. He was the original, the Invisible Man. Oh. Oh, wait, is he the dude that she actually runs off with in Cleopatra? No, I mean in Casablanca? No, that's not him. Who the hell was he in Casablanca? He plays the um, kind of like French, uh, I guess like, like chief of police, who is Humphrey Bogart's friend. All right. Do you know who else is in Casablanca? Because I feel you're trying to go to get to Casablanca. No, no, no. I can actually use Humphrey Bogart quietly. Um, shit. How can you use Humphrey Bogart? Oh, I know how you can. I know how you can use Humphrey Bogart. Yeah. So. Hmm. 
and I'm going to go kind of a long way. As long as it's within six. Within six. Can I do this in six? Mm. 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 I'm not going to give it away, Farrell Blackwell. All right. I'm going to need your name with the actor's name, though. Mm. I'm also mixing. Okay. Derville Martin is in Sheba Baby with Pam Greer. Pam Greer is in Jackie Brown with Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson is in Jungle Fever with Halle Berry. Halle Berry is in um, Baps with um, what's the butler's name in Baps? That's the name I need. The butler's name in Baps. The butler in the Baps. butler in Baps. Okay, all right. Huh. That's not where I thought you were going. Uh. Butler in Baps. So let me get to the movie. Oh, I might be. Oh, I'm not going to have enough. You always got to do the movie. Google. I'm not going to have enough. Google search. Uh, that would be Ian Richardson. Yeah, but I'm going to run out. It's going to be more than six. So I got to get to. I got to get to Baps quicker. So I could get to Haley Berry. Wicker. So what did I, I said, boom, boom. So Haley Berry was three. I need to get mm -hmm. to Haley Berry quick. All right. Dovo Martin is in. <sighs> Wait a minute. Who plays Sam in Casablanca? Who was that? Oh, it's not. Um, oh, it's a good question. Uh, hold on. Who plays it? It's it. Oh man, I'm, I'm mad. I'm mad that I don't know it right off the top of my head. Casablanca. The cast is. Hold on, I'm pulling it up on the Google. I know people are shouting it in the chat. No, actually, they're not. Um, that's good. Uh, de -de 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 oh, great. They don't have his name right there. Uh, How can he not have Sam's name? I know. He's the one playing it again. I know, but he's not like one of the. That's crazy. Uh, Dooley Wilson. Yeah, I don't know about Dooley Wilson. That's like his most popular. Um, I know. I know. Okay. Wait. Wait a minute. What is the Femme Fatale's name in the Maltese Falcon? Who is that? That is... Um, that's not going to get you there. That's not going to get you there. I can't remember her name right now, but I'm almost certain she's not going to get you there. She's not... She's not a name like you would know. Yeah, Claude Rains. So he's in Casablanca. He's in The Invisible Man. He's in a ton of films. I mean, I don't, you know. What's his last film? What was his last film? Yeah. Um, just to, to tell you, because you asked. The femme fatale in The Maltese Falcon is Mary Astor. Right. So, yeah, I can't do no Mary Astor. Yeah, so, yeah I told you. That wasn't going to that wasn't going to do it for you. Um Claude Rains, let me just pull uh, pull him up and go to his filmography to get to his last film, which was in 1965, The Greatest Story Ever Told. Mm. So he in the one movie that Charlton Heston isn't in. <laughs> I mean, the man was in a ton of films. 
what, really Len using a ton of films. He, I mean, he, he and, was. And a ton of, he was a superstar he's a, he, in his day. He, 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 what day was this? In his day, <laughs> right, right. he was a big name. All right. All right. All right. I'm cast aspersions to I'm Claude Rains. Aspersions. He was in films that I'm not going to name them because I... Like I said, people think I take it too easy on you. But if I did name them, because I gave you Casablanca. You did give me Casablanca. If I gave you a couple of other films, you would be like, ow, ow, ow. Give me one more big one. All right. Because it's nobody in Invisible Man. All right. He was in, I don't know if this was the original. He was in 1935. Oh, for God's sake. Scrooge. Really? That's that's the other big one you're gonna give me the one from 1935. You know what? You know what, Lynn? All right, no, 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 no. All right, bad, bad. Okay. <laughs> Derville Martin is in five on a black hand side with Dick Anthony Williams. Mm -hmm. Dick Anthony Williams is in Mm, I just, I got to move. I got to get to. I, I just got to get to Haley Berry quicker. Like I actually have my path. I just have to get to Haley Berry quicker. So you just want to stick with this path because you know other ways. Is that what you're saying? I mean, this is the, I mean, this is the only path I'm going to get to Humphrey Bogart. Okay. Let me see if I can do it. All right. So oh, fuck it. Dick Anthony Williams. Everybody in Mobetta Blues that's in Jungle Fever. So <laughs> so you know, we'll you know, let's say Spike Lee, Haley Berry. They're both in Jungle Field. Haley Berry's in BAPS with Ian Richardson. Mm -hmm. Ian Richardson. Oh, I'm, I'm one short because Ian Richardson is in My Fair Lady with um, Audrey Hepburn, who's in Sabrina with Humphrey Bogart. Mm. But that's six. Mm. Yeah, before you get to Humphrey Bogart. And you got to get to Claude Rains. Right, but he's in Casablanca with Claude Rains. Okay. <clears throat> Derville Martin is in so what i say I cannot, I can't, ah, uh, and I know as soon as I get home, I'm going to figure it out. Give me a movie not from 1935. All right. Just to show you how ubiquitous this man's work was, give me a year. You said 1965 was his last film? Yeah. 1964. 1964. Uh, he didn't do a film in 64. In 1963. He was in Twilight of Honor. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me with this. <laughs> like, really? He did a, a really big film in 1962, but I can't give you that one. No, you're going to have to give me that. And, it, like, and I'm curious about what this really big film is. Lawrence of Arabia. Who's in Lawrence of Arabia besides, um, who was that? Is that Peter, o not Peter O'Toole? Yes, uh, it's Peter O'Toole. Yeah, Peter O'Toole. Alec Guinness, Omar Sharif, Anthony Quinn. Okay. All right. Fine. Jose Ferrer. All right. And Claude Rains. <laughs> As who? Uh, Mr. Dryden. Oh, well, there you go. I mean, I'll just use Alec Guinness, but I mean, you know. So, 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 what's, what's, don't what's, be so la di da. No, I am la di da <laughs> because Claude Rains is in. What is this? What is Claude Rains? <laughs> I just named one of the biggest films yes. of all time. Yes. And yes. he was in it. Yes. He's, so so yeah. put some respect yeah. on the man's name. Right, right. He, he was like fifth build. 
Go ahead. Yeah. Do it. And then I'm going to shut you up about yeah. Claude Rains. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and uh-huh. I'm going to show you the easier path. That yeah. You okay. Took. So he's in um, the final come down with um, Billy D. Williams, mm-hmm. who's in Empire Strikes Back with everybody in Empire Strikes Back, who all of them are in Star Wars with Alec Guinness, mm-hmm. who's in uh, Lawrence of Arabia with Claude Rains. Okay. Who's like the fifth build guy. Okay. Uh huh. Now, before you Uh you keep this disrespect to Claude Rains, yes. Uh, first of all, you mentioned Humphrey Bogart. Yes. Let me tell you, without even me looking into it, okay, the easier path that you could have went. Okay. Dervell Martin is in. Guess who's coming to dinner with Catherine Hepburn, who was in the African Queen with Humphrey Bogart Mother, sure who is, is in, in who is Casablanca in with, with ah, I forgot Catherine Hepburn is in the African Queen now that's a good one that's the way I should have went yes yeah especially since you mentioned I, that I, you right I said went. Humphrey yeah you're right now, you are right yeah that's the way I should have went now you putting all this disrespect on my man's name. Yes. The original The Invisible Man. Y- yes. Which is not a small thing. I'd look, it's not it a small thing. It was a hit film. In 1930 what? 1933. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, look, all of those movies from back then. Yes. Dracula, Frankenstein. Yeah, so, yeah. Don't, so don't just asperge because it was Yes, but you're trying to connect somebody that was making movies damn near into silent movies. Well, I did it. I just did it in yes. four movies. Yes. All yes. right. So get off your high horse, yes. Mr. Ladi Da. But in regards to Mr. Claude Rains, not only was he in The Invisible Man, not only was he in Scrooge, two big films, especially Scrooge, Uh I don't care what you say from 1935, still gets played every Christmas, Uh all right? And he played in that film Jacob Marley, which yes. was a big role in the yes, film. Yes, yes, Not Mr. Scrooge, but yeah, okay, go ahead. Okay, he wasn't old enough. <laughs> okay, yeah. All right? But he was also played Prince John in the adventures of Robin Hood he was Prince with John. Earl Flynn. Errol Flynn and I know that's a movie you've he, seen, he, yes, Vincent. That's, right. that's a Vincent. That's a movie you should have right, known. Right, but he was <laughs> who, rem- who remembers Claude Rains in it? Prince John is 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 one of the he's one of the bad guys. He's yes. one of the main protagonists yes. in the film, right, right. along a, with the, the sheriff of right, Nottingham. Right. He's one of the right. He's one of the bad. No, guys. but he's, he's there's like, only two. Yeah, but everyone it's him and the, the sheriff, right, of the sheriff of Nottingham, Nottingham which is what. Do everyone, you know who played the sheriff of Nottingham? No, I don't. You know who else doesn't know? No one. That plenty of people. Everyone knows Errol Flynn, and they know who played the sheriff of no, Nottingham. They yes, who? they do. Who played him? Basil Rathbone. Famously, who played Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, Holmes and all right. those films. They know about Basil Rathbone and Sherlock Holmes. And, and they also know about him as... Okay, all they right. They do fine, so. Fine, anyway, fine, anyway, fine. so uh-huh. he was in that. Okay. He was in Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, but, which was a big film. But he wasn't um, which my face, though. No, he was not Mr. Smith. He, he was not Jimmy um Stewart. No, but he was right. He was the, the main, other. He was the other guy. He's the main protagonist in the no, film. No, the protagonist was Mr. Smith. But Jimmy oh, right. Well, he's the antagonist. He was he? Antagonist. He was. Was he? He was. He was, was he? in Here Comes Mr. What, Jordan. Was he Was he Mr. Jordan? Yes, he was. What is What is that, though? You don't know what Here Comes Mr. Jordan? I was Mr. about to say, you say Here Comes, and I realized, what the hell is Here Comes Mr. Here Jordan? Here Comes Mr. Jordan is the film that would be remade with Warren Beatty um, as, what's the movie where he goes to, he's the football player, goes to heaven? Um, heaven Can Wait? Heaven Can Wait. So it's the movie that Heaven Can Wait is based on. Yeah. Does anyone know that Heaven Can Wait was based on? <laughs> Are you building your case or my case? No, a lot of people know. Ooh, film buffs uh, know. Oh, film buffs? Cl- uh, Claude Rains was also in The Wolfman and the original Wolfman. But he played, He was not the right, Wolfman. Because that's Boris. But he was, that's he, Lon was in, he was in, in Now Voyager with Betty Davis, a very famous film. He oh, was in Casablanca, as we <laughs> talked about. Right, he he, like was, he was the Phantom of the Opera mm-hmm. in that film. He was Mr. Skeffington, which is a great movie. Oh, oh, he was oh, in Notorious, which is a fantastic He's uh, in Notorious? Yes. Who's he playing Notorious? He plays Alexander Sebastian. He is the antagonist in that film. That that um uh uh, Alfred Hitchcock okay. film. All right, opposite Cary Grant. All right, well, yes, because Cary Grant is is the star in the <laughs> He's in Judgment at Nuremberg. Oh, well, there you go. 
<laughs> look, I'm not going to have this disrespect oh, for Claude Rains. All right. Claude Rains oh. was a bad man in his day, man. Now, oh. mind you, he was a historically short man, and he was known for in a lot of his films that he would walk into scenes and then step up on a platform so that he would appear the same height as his leading woman. But that's not the that's point. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is... Well, there you go. I had difficulty <laughs> connecting Derville Martin to Claude Rains. Yes, I did. I mean, he was in Here Comes Mr. Jordan. A good film. Which is the film that Heaven Can Wait is based on. Is based on. You ready for the easy one now? <laughs> who's, who's the easy one going to be? <laughs> Claude Rains. <laughs> he got you, stumped you. He, he, he absolutely did. Oh, if I could get to Haley Berry with one less step. Go ahead. Get from Dervil Martin. Dervil Martin. To Tyra Farrell. Oh, yeah. I don't want to get to Tyra Farrell. No, I want to get to Tyra Farrell. There you go. See, did you see what I did? See, I set you up because it's, it's, yeah, Tyra Farrell. Thank you. Happily married woman. Yeah, I know. Uh, you know, since we're already playing with Jungle Fever, Devro Martin is in Jackie Brown. I mean, Foxy Brown, Jackie Brown, Jungle Fever. Samuel Jackson's in Jungle Fever with Wesley Snipes, who's in White Men Can't Jump with Tyra Farrell. Okay. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Very good, Vincent. Yeah. You nailed it. Yay, Tyra Farrell. Well, you know, this, this is not. She actually came up because uh, I don't even know what the occasion was, but a picture of her mm -hmm. and, and her husband came up on the screen like, on my computer. Cross yeah. my, cross yeah. my way. Cross like, your head. Wow. Look. That's a. Uh, Always time for Tyra Farrell. Always got some time for Tyra Always Farrell. got some time for Tyra Farrell. Stunning woman and an actress who did not get her due as far as the roles. And does not. I mean, no. right, she's, I mean, she's alive. No, she is alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, yeah, but I mean, but you know, I mean, yeah. she's, she was definitely doing her moment. Had she her should've. moment. Yeah. Because you know? like, I mean, we have not done White Men Can't Jump. No, we have not. Isn't that weird? It seems like we would have by now. There's a lot of films it seems like we would have. Yeah, but, but like, so we've seen her in Poetic Justice. Mm -hmm. We saw her. When's, when's when? When else did we talk about her? We talk, I know we talked. We saw about her in School Days. Talked about her in School Days. Um, Boys in the Hood. Oh, we have we done? Boys? No, we haven't done Boys. We've done Boys. We haven't done Boys in the Hood yet. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. So really, it, it really it was just um, School poetic Days justice. and Poetic Justice. Yeah. That and I love her in White Men Can't Jump. Touched on her. Yeah, I absolutely love her in that movie. So, all right, all right, all right, all right. You know, Claude Rains, man. <laughs> I like her. Claude Rains. Uh, Nina says, Y'all stalling like y'all about to disrespect Chameleon Street in this review. Well, sounds to me that's a perfect segue into our review of Chameleon Street. But first, it's time for trailer talk. Trailer talk. Just a little bit of trailer talk because this is the part of the the uh, video and the podcast that will be excised from the yes. podcast. Um, so we can talk about whatever the hell we want and we can talk about it in any fucking way we want. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> what you want to talk about? What's on your mind, L Lynn Webb? Um, nothing particular. Oh, oh. I have stopped started watching a show. Okay. On uh Hulu. Okay. Um, and I don't really go to Hulu a lot. I don't I don't know why. I just don't go there. Okay. Even though I have Hulu without commercials. Okay. <laughs> Look, if I'm gonna pay for a service, <laughs> I don't want commercials. <laughs> right? Got the rich man's Hulu. Do you have Hulu? Yes, but I have it with commercials. I sit and eat my beans out of a can. And, and, and watch Hulu with commercials. I don't understand. I don't understand how you could, but you have Disney Plus, don't you? Yes. If you have Disney Plus, why not just cough up the extra dough to get Hulu without the commercials? Because I, I mean, it's just not worth it. To Do you watch a lot of Hulu? 
I watch some things on Hulu. I'm like, I'm like working my way through Bob's Burgers. I love Bob. Burgers. You know, I just watched. The movie. This is even where I was going. I just saw the movie. I just started watching it maybe two weeks ago. I enjoyed it. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Bob's Burgers. Oh, the show. Like, I just started Bob's Burgers. You like it? I do like it's it. Such, it's such a funny show. Yeah. yeah. It's such a funny. And the movie is good. Okay. The movie is actually pretty good. Um, But you started watching on Hulu. Because they got a, a lot of FX shows. Mm hmm And I started watching The Bear. Do you know yeah, about this show? Yeah, I've heard the about Bear it. Yeah. On FX. Uh, the Bear, which... You know, at first I heard a lot about it, but I wasn't I wasn't sure if I wanted to check it out. But then I saw that it stars um my man from Shameless. Yes. Um it starred, I want to get this uh Jeremy Allen White. Mm -hmm. He stars as a restaurateur who comes back home to Chicago to run basically this his family sandwich shop. Right. Uh, after his brother, who was running it, uh, kills himself. Okay. And it's just the whole machinations of it, of him leaving the high life in New York and now having to deal with this sandwich shop and getting it up and running and back to it, trying to find his former glory while also trying to manage, you know, the the crew who were used to the way that his brother and his cousin ran it and mm -hmm. also reconnect with his family, who he's had a bit of a falling out on. Okay. It's a half hour show. Um a bit of a it's definitely a comedy, maybe maybe more dramedy, but uh it's it's well told. It's very it it, it gets into the stress of, you know, of such an eatery in Chicago at this time cuz it's definitely like just a corner eatery like sandwich, hot dog, you know, slice Slice meat sandwich mm -hmm. joint. Um, the cast is great. Uh, I really enjoy the cast, um, especially, and I want to make sure that I get her name, uh, Ayo Itibiri, who plays this young, like, intern. Okay. Who comes there to work at the, at the restaurant at the same time that at, as he comes back home and she, unlike everybody else in the, in the crew has the formal training. Right. Right. right? So she's got to kind of like work her way with the crew as well. Um, and it's really, it's, it's, it's really dope. It's, it's really fun. There's one season out right now. It's been renewed for a second season on FX. Um, and it's a, it's a lot of fun. I really, uh, I'm not through the, the first season, but it really is pretty dope, and I'm enjoying it a great deal. I've heard good things about it. I'm, I think Camille might be watching it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've heard, you know, it's gotten solid reviews, and mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's pretty. So it, I'll put it on the list. You should. Okay. You should. Fair uh, enough. And a lot of people have been talking about the old man, which is the Jeff Bridges show. Yeah, I think my brother was talking about that. You're uh you're absolutely right because he, he's yeah. in the chat saying yeah. that he's been watching the old man on Hulu. If anyone is thinking of watching it, don't oh. do it. <laughs> it doesn't live up to the teasers. Oh. Well, there you go. <laughs> and here's the thing: I I wasn't really that interested in seeing it because it strikes me as Jeff Bridges doing his like Liam Neeson, right, right, his old taking, badass yeah, man yeah. thing. And and I got a lot of love for Jeff Bridges, but. I don't I don't need to see a series of that. Okay. I'm good with that. I won't put that on the list. Yeah. This has all been this has been a very useful trailer talk. No. We 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 aim to try and educate. Um let's see. And somebody else was pointing out that Eve's Bayou is yeah. going to be moving to the Criterion collection. Yes, sir. Um very soon. And I believe it's it's set to show up there in uh, October, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool, mm -hmm. and Absolutely. and well deserved. Oh, oh, oh. Like, like depending on which way the wind is blowing and and what time of day it is, might be my favorite movie. Full stop. Yeah, I, I, I can go yeah. with you there. Like, if you ask me tomorrow afternoon, I'll say like do the right thing, but it it really is 
like depending on what like i love eve's by you so much yeah so it's hard to imagine that this made the criterion collection cut before certain other films i could talk about and perhaps i will talk about in a moment or two well you know licensing you don't know what's available licensing really you think that's the issue that it didn't make it until now yeah i mean it could be i don't know no, i don't know no. how that works we'll see we shall see you got to pay cassie lemons you just putting cassie lemons shit on stuff i'm sure she'll that's right i'm sure she'll make it work i mean it, she'll make it work if you make it workable for her well you don't think criterion collection would make it work for her? well well apparently it took a, a while i was about to say <laughs> Yeah, they did now. But you know, maybe maybe five years ago they came at it a little disrespectfully, and she said, "No, no, thank you. Mm. I'll defer." Mm. So, mm. they came at her like you did on Claude Rains. Oh, for God's sake! Y yes, yes, I, I could help. I'm not letting you. I'm not letting you live that down. Oh, I'm not letting you live that down. We are both communally not letting each other live that down. Well, I didn't. This doesn't for me to let down. That was a good selection. Oh, for God. Yeah, sure. It wasn't good Anytime enough. you start with his biggest hits are in 1930, whatever you, you say after 1930, it's like, uh-oh, here we go. But wait, what's, what's that supposed to mean? There weren't, those, those stars don't count? The stars of the 30s and 40s are not do, uh, do their just do? Is that no, what you're saying? That's that's yeah, that is actually what I'm saying. Why? Nobody watching them old ass movies, Lynn. Those are good movies. I didn't say they weren't. See, do you see? You see what I, I didn't say they weren't good. I mean, you know, things are good, like lots of stuff. But well, like, okay, define old ass because there's some people who say look, the 20 year mo these movies that are 20 years old are old anything ass. before World War II. What? What about is an old ass movie? Okay, but it doesn't mean that they're not worthy to to revisit, right? Right, and, and to cherish some and, of the and and call out and cherish and the performances some in them, the performances, and then try and connect them to people and make some type of. I did it in four movies. movies. You're just mad you that did. it took you an hour you did. You to did. do it in six. I always forget Humphrey Bogart's non. Actually, I never think about Humphrey Bogart as funny. But well, the African Queen is not a comedy. He's kind of funny in it because yeah, he's, he's kind of drunk. Funny. And, yeah. You know, yeah, you know. And I thought I was doing something trying to get to Sabrina, because even in Sabrina, oh Sabrina's uh, no, he's kind of like he's he's playing a not Humphrey Bogart type. Yeah, because he's totally miscast. Yeah, so and totally too old but, for that role. But yeah, I do always forget about the African Queen. You know what I mix the African Queen up with? What's the movie with Cary Grant? And um, is that Doris Day, where he's the drunk with the boat? Oh, I think that is Doris Day. Um, I know what movie you're talking about. Yeah, because it's it's older Cary Grant. Yeah, and it's it's basically an African Queen riff. Mm, yeah, aren't there kids involved in that one too? I think maybe. Yeah, yeah. And it's not it's not a it's not it's not high on his filmography. Yeah, it's one of his last films. Yeah. Now you're not thinking about what is it in twelve make twelve gets egg roll. No, I don't think that was it. No, I don't think that. I said you're not mixing it because you said it's kids. Maybe, maybe that is what I'm thinking of. I, yeah. I, I, I'm going to look it up real quick. All right. Now we got to actually do. Cary Grant, here. Doris Day. He's like a drunk sailor. Yeah. I know the movie. Um, oh, this I, I don't think this was it. Uh, they were in A Touch of Mink. No, that's not it. Together. What? what I don't. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's Doris Day. I'm not 100. Maybe it sure wasn't Doris, Doris Day because I know the movie you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and he's like a drunk. Yeah, boat captain. All right, hold on. So now I got now now I got to look up Cary Grant. Oh, Cary. <laughs> I didn't mean that. Well, this will all be cut out, so it's all fine. Uh, oh, Father Goose. Father Goose, and it's not Doris Day. Is that Catherine Hepburn? No, it's Leslie Caron. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm thinking about Father Goose. Yeah. Always mix Father Goose up with the African Queen. 1964. Yeah. Yeah, which is, um, and this definitely was a later film, Touch of Mink, was 1962. Yeah. Okay. I really like Father Goose. They used to play Father Goose on, like, the weekends. Play that movie? Yeah. Like, for some reason, I've seen Father Goose, like, three times. Yeah, 
That's cute, yeah. though. Yeah. That's cute. But all right. All right. Let's uh let's see where are we going here. Um a lot of people still caping for only murders in the building. Still haven't started it. You know what? You actually told me I might not like it though. Yeah, but I think there's a reason I haven't returned to it. Because while I do think it is it's a well-made show. <sighs> How Martin Short is Martin Short in it? Little Martin Short goes a long way with me. He's cool. Okay. He's a, he's like he's older, so he's right. you know, and he's he's in he's not over the top all right. at all. I think it's you know, like the the movie uh, the the series is set in the um what's that part of the film? um New York the West Upper East Side. Yeah, I guess I think it's the Upper West Side. Upper West Side, it's like it's more like affluent. Yeah, it's, it's, area. It looks, it looks pretty blindingly white. Yeah, it looks a little. And I think there's something about that that kind of like, you know, as I was watching it, as much as I was enjoying it, like because sometimes I can detach myself from that mm -hmm. and just get lost in the in the storytelling, and I I kind of leaves you cold. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, I can see that. You know, like this is cool. It's good. And people that like it, God bless you. Not I, your jam. I, I don't need to finish it. All right. You know, I ain't mad at y'all, but I don't need to finish it. So, and and yeah, and I think that will really far. Like, you will notice that right off the bat. Yeah. You know, and you will be like, I ain't got time for this. I mean, look, Steve Martin's pretty un unapologetic about his place in the world at this point. And as well, he should be. The I mean, man has look, earned his stripes. Yeah, so, I'm a yeah. huge, I'm a Steve Martin fan, right. so it's Steve fine. Steve Martin ain't going to be nowhere with Issa Rae. <laughs> and he really is stuck. Uh, Nina says that mur only murders isn't as white as they could have made it, though. Well, maybe so. <laughs> True, because Selena Gomez is in it. But they, they sh that should be their tagline. <laughs> it's not as white as you think. It could have been whiter. <laughs> Don't act like Taylor Swift couldn't have played this role. <laughs> it could have been wider. <laughs> okay. Only murders in the building. It could have been wider. Right. All right, come on, let's go. All right. <clears throat> Chameleon Street, a 1989 independent film written, directed, and starring Wendell B. Harris Jr. It tells the story of a social chameleon who impersonates reporters, doctors, and lawyers in order to make money. The film is a satire based on the life of Detroit con artist and high school dropout William Douglas Street Jr., who successfully impersonated professional reporters, lawyers, and even surgeons. This 1989 film, which apparently was a darling of the festival circuit at that time, was the selection of Vincent Williams for tonight's stop on the Michaud Mission. Vincent, what say you of Chameleon Street? Chameleon Street is 100% an example of a film that the only reason I knew about it is because we do this podcast. Mm. I um, At least one person, maybe two people have mentioned it to me over the years saying, oh, well, hey, you know, have y'all looked at Chameleon Street? What do you think about Chameleon Street? Uh, just reading, just reading about them saying, you remember last year I was reading um, Film Blackness. Yes. American Cinema and the Idea of Black Film by Michael Boyce Gillespie. Yes. A book I strongly recommend. He is a um, film prof mm -hmm. at a city college in New York. Uh, Shout out to Dr. Gillespie if anybody knows him, please tell him I'm a fan of his book. But he has he has a whole chapter on it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, as you mentioned, it's it's a, it's a media darling. It won the grand prize at Sundance that year. But it is a film that is is really one that people don't talk about. Mm -hmm. You know that that arguably has vanished. And it is a film that frustrated me 
in a way that the more I think about it, frustrated me in a good way. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there for just a split second because I think your camera may be frozen. So I'm going to remove it from the stream and then try adding it back to the stream and see if this refreshes it. I don't know. Nobody is it's it's screaming that it's frozen. So I'm maybe it's just frozen on my computer. Um because I was waiting for people in the chat to like tell me that your screen was frozen. Uh but they haven't yet. And they're still not, yet you are still frozen here. Uh and nobody is responding to me in the chat saying that you weren't frozen. So I'm going to do this. Oh, it was frozen for a minute, and apparently it was not frozen anymore, they're saying. Um, it's showing as blank black. So, okay, so it's, something is happening with your screen. All right, so I'm going to kick you from the studio. Okay. And I'm going to come over there to you and get your camera set back up again. I'm doing this in uh, real time, ladies and gentlemen. Sit still. We'll be right back. You can talk. They can hear you. But I don't want you to talk about the show. Just, just talk. Let's go here. Let's go there. Let's go there. And change the camera position. Oh, there we go. All right. All right. See you. See you. All right. All right. All right. Right, right, right. You're on the studio. And there you are. And there you are. And there you are. And there we are. Yes. Yes. Your audio was fine because that's coming from a different power source. But right. the camera was. Now we're helping with the editing of it. Is, is it time for me to go? You can Should go. I go? This is a film that is frustrating in what I think ends up being a good way to me because you can't really put your hand on the film. Mm -hmm. And I think the part that really captures that for me was the end of the film. Okay. After the entire film, as you said, this is a film based um, loosely on the life of William Douglas Street, who was someone who was a con artist who impersonated all these different people. Um, as the title says, Chameleon, this is a film about identity mm -hmm. and personality and everything. So at the end of the film, after we've had an hour and a half of this character portraying all of these different people, over the credits, you have a montage of people telling the story of the frog and the scorpion. Yes. And I love it because you know the story. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. Everyone the knows the story. The people telling the story all are telling it differently. Like they're all adding their own parts. They're all saying it in their own voices. They're all so that as someone who has watched the whole film, I'm thinking, ah, this is Wendell Harris's final statement on this character, basically saying that no matter what the details are, no matter who's telling the story, at the end of it, your identity is your identity. So that you know that the story is going to land on what the story lands on, where the scorpion is on the back of the frog and the, the scorpion stings the frog halfway across the water. They both drown. And as they're drowning, when the frog says, why would you do that? Because now we're all drowning. We're both drowning. And the scorpion says, it is in my nature. They tell the story. They get to the end of the story. The final words of the story, of the anecdote, come from either Wendell Harris, the actor, or Wendell Harris portraying William Douglas Street, the character. Mm -hmm. He's partially shaded because he's sitting back and he's backlit. backlit and he says it's in my character, which is sort of like it's in my nature. 
Mm -hmm. But character is a different word than nature. So that it's in my character in a film about identity, you start to think, well, is this, is he saying that the scorpion is playing a character and that this is just something he has decided to do? And again, in my mind, this is an example of how you look for meaning in this film. Like you look for meaning, that's what you do. And, and it's hard to find it. Like this is a film again about a man who he, he pretends to be a surgeon. Mm -hmm. He pretends to be a student at Yale. Yep. He pretends to be a um, reporter. He pretends to be a lawyer. And many people, including, you know, Dr. Gillespie and people who talk about this film sort of fit it within the, the literary and artistic tradition of passing. Mm. So this is a character who is passing. Mm. But Harris complicates that almost immediately, because when you think about passing in the tradition of passing in films like, um, like, like, like imitation of life or even something like six <laughs> appropriately enough, six degrees of separation. When you look at how passing works, it's always a character who is trying to take on whiteness as a way to get access mm -hmm. on the one hand. And on the other hand, he rejects blackness. But moment, I mean, example after example, all four of those examples, the film goes out of its way to show other black writers. You know, the secretary outside is a writer who catches him with um, a misspelling in a letter when he's a reporter. There are other black physicians when he's pretending to be a doctor. There are other black students at Yale. There are other black lawyers. So that this kind of simple reading of, okay, well, this is a poor black man and he's pretending to be something else. And this is commentary on race and class. And, 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 and again, when you read some of the reviews that, that like this film, you see that like everyone like Richard Brody at the New Yorker is, is a huge, is a huge champion of this film. And he talks about that. And I, 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 I think that's a little, too straightforward because he blurs all of that with everything I just said. Mm. The flip side, that kind of self-loathing that you get with these black characters who pass again, whether you're talking about imitation of life, whether you're talking about, you know, something like, um, you know, I don't know, something like, like Charles Chess. I think the conjure woman has somebody passing. There's always this kind of self-loathing yeah. that, you know, I'm trying to, separate myself from this blackness but this is a character that not only is very much black through speech and 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 behavior like like he's around black people he talks about like he he he, he employs wordplay where where you know he, he almost is part of this trickster tradition but you have this disdain for whiteness that he has a couple of, whether he's talking about white people smell like dogs or, mm -hmm. you know, white people going to get tans. And so that's too easy. Then there's the film itself, which I have to say, I don't know if I've ever seen a film with the wildly divergent reviews that this film has. Washington Post said, and I'm going to read this directly. What a, a brilliant concept. Unfortunately, Harris just isn't a filmmaker, not even the most rudimentary sense. Mm -hmm. His failures are all on the most basic level. He can't plot or shape scenes. He can't draw out actors. He can't write dialogue or mount. He can't create any consistent rhythms or sense of pace. And you have reviews like this where people just hate this film. But this is a film that won the grand prize at Sundance. This is a film that is part of the Criterion Collection. You know, as I said, Richard Brody, a very well-respected, I mean, the dude is the film critic for The New Yorker, is, is like, 
like you, you read him talking about it and it's like you're you're on the schoolyard when you're 11 you're like why don't you marry it if you love it so much <laughs> like he really is all in and just for me this is a film like you look at my notes and i have scratch outs and i have question marks and i can't quite grasp what I think about this movie. Like I can't like, 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 like I, I read, I read the vitriol in, in reviews, like the one I just read from the Washington post. Mm -hmm. And I say, Oh yeah. Yeah. I very much see what they're saying. But then, you know, I'll read the chapter by Dr. Gillespie in film blackness. And he talks about all of these, these themes of identity mm -hmm. and, and, and transgressive, ideas about race and i say okay i kind of see that too and i played fair we've talked about this periodically where we're where we watch it one time film comes on we watch it we come in here we give the review based on that one viewing i don't know what i have after one viewing But I almost feel like that's what Wendell Harris wanted. Mm. Because I wonder if the final con that Wendell Harris has pulled is that he is this artist who has put on this persona of filmmaker and made this film. And and I will steal this out from from the, where it's almost a Rorschach test, where like what you pull from the film tells you more about you than the film itself. And although I don't know what I want to do with this movie, I do think I want to watch it again. I know that I don't want to watch it again. And I think you were mentioning about Richard Brody and his love for this film, Richard Brody of The New Yorker. He also wrote a story about this film back in uh, September of last year, mm -hmm. talking about how it is an overworked, an overlooked classic, but found it interesting that Wendell Harris has not done a second film since then. Even mm -hmm. though, like we said, and you mentioned, it was a darling of the festival circuit and he was called in for pitch meetings left and right. And yet he was unable to land another film. And I have to say, I can see why. I appreciate all of the ideas that you say that you are able to see on display in this film. And I think for the most part, I do agree with you that the ideas of this kind artist um, and the commentary that is what's happening here uh, makes in regards to, you know, people who, uh, who pass or have a bit of a self-loathing and it definitely is a self-loathing about him. The, the, the movie opens up with him just, you know, just going in on his life and just like wanting, trying to find some way out of the life that he was living. Um, even though in many ways, the life that he is living, he is because of his own doing, mm -hmm. you know, he, you know, he never really confronts that, mm -hmm. but that is also indicative of many people. In, in films and especially self-loathers, you know, they never want to see their own culpability in um, the feelings that they really, that they are, have in regards to their lot in life. And, th and that definitely is, it's kind of there. The problem though, and you were talking, you were reading some of the reviews, um, there was a review from the Hartford Quran uh, at the time that says that Chameleon Street feels like a series of improvised skits, some imaginative and funny, some hackneyed. Um, and that is the problem with this movie. They do feel like skits. 
they do feel like you are just walking in and out of like you're on a sound stage and you're walking from one set to another set to another skit and the through line of the story that is supposed to be there i think is is not well written it's not well delivered from a directorial point of view it's not well performed from an acting point of view um, and thus you, or at least I found myself getting lost in the story and mm -hmm. not exactly sure who was who, like there's a moment where he is, he's, he's married to, um, to, to one woman. And then he starts a relationship at different times. He starts a relationship with other women and it's hard to, to, remember who is who who is his wife who is his girlfriend um who does he actually have some type of feelings for you left you're you're meant to believe that his the woman that he married is kind of like the love of his life yet he disparages her throughout the film mm -hmm. and also cheats on her yes repeatedly throughout the film and there's no come up it's for that at, at all except all the way <laughs> at the end yeah there he does get his come up at the end but when but when that happens it happens so out of the blue that you don't feel anything for it because there's no type of pacing to this film at all there's no type of skill to the storytelling in this film and while this may be his first film um we've talked about it often you know especially here 1989 this is the time when black performers are getting their their chance to get their stories out there on an independent level because everybody's looking for the next spike lee and, yes and so this is his opportunity and i don't feel that he, he doesn't nail it at all i think he is a man who fought who fell in love with his voice he has a very good dynamic yes. uh speaking voice and he you know falls in love with it uh he is the pretty much for the most part there may be two other performers in this film who maybe have 20 other lines mm -hmm. every yep. other line is him and if it's not him acting it it's him in a voiceover and it is a voiceover that is not needed in the film because a lot of time the voiceover is telling you what is already happening on the screen, you know? Um, so that is a botched opportunity. There is one scene that happens in a bar where this, this white guy comes up and is totally belligerent, totally racist to him and his girlfriend. And that scene is only there so that Wendell P. Ha B. Harris can do his version right. of the famous scene. Uh, speaking of uh, Steve Martin, as we were doing mm -hmm. in the trailer talk. <laughs> How about that? It's so that he can do his version of Steve Martin's famous scene from the film Roxanne, where he kind of makes fun of himself and and his nose in that Cyrano de Bergiac, um, right. you know, uh, spoof uh, that that Roxanne is, this is where he can make fun of this racist in as many, you know, different ways as he can. And he doesn't deliver it. He, 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 he doesn't get it over. He doesn't get it over from a directing standpoint. He doesn't get it over from an acting standpoint. You don't, you're not meant to care or, or really even feel any of the tension of the moment. Um, I just think that this is another one of those films that is unfortunately a bit of a, I want to say that it's a missed opportunity because I get what he was going for, but I don't think he delivers on it in, in any way. I think every step of the way, there's one thing for something to be low budget. There's something for it to be independent. There's another thing for something to come across as, amateurish and i think that there's a lot of this film that comes off as very amateurish um and it starts with 
unfortunately, the writer, the director, and the star, Wendell B. Harris Jr. I, I and outside of whatever the critics, you know, liked uh, of this film, and to be fair, um, let me show some love for my home paper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, who said that though, like his subject, the film goes on some pretty strange tangents, Chameleon Street is uh, largely successful as the diary of a compulsive trickster whose marks are suckered by streets, confidence and instinct. I don't get anything of, of his confidence. I don't, I don't, I am bewildered that people fall for what is being performed on this, on the screen. I'm mind you, I'm not expecting this to be catch me if you can, which is the great Steven Spielberg movie with um, Leonardo DiCaprio and Tom Hanks. Leonardo DiCaprio playing a con artist, playing someone who um, dips in dips into different identities uh, throughout the film, and Tom Hanks on on his trail. This movie also has cops on his trail. You're not meant to care about any of them because they just seem to just show up random like the Spanish Inquisition in the Mighty Python uh, skit. I think that this film is just a just really just a miss and I am bewildered how this made it to the Criterion Collection. Well, that's the question, isn't it? I will say about his confidence and and I'm glad you brought up that scene in the bar. I, I and I connect that to to your observation about the voiceover. One thing that I did do immediately when the film started and the voiceover started and that this is one of the notes I didn't cross out is I said that this is an unreliable narrator. Mm -hmm. I mean, he tells you at the very beginning, I am a liar. And then basically the next hour and a half Everything you see is basically what I'm telling you. Right. Like, as you said, oftentimes his voiceover is describing the action on the screen. So even that part about where you don't, where there's a disconnect between what you see about his level of confidence being able to pull this off and his pulling off these four cons basically mm -hmm. i i kind of get put you know i took even that with a pinch of salt because i said okay this is him telling the story the one scene that made me think okay maybe there's something going on that i'm not getting okay Appropriately enough, happens towards the end of the film, like I said, with the the scene over the credits. There's a scene towards the end where he is, you find out, playing a game with his daughter. Mm -hmm. With this knife. Yeah. And there's blood. And, and there are music cues that this person that you've been watching this whole time maybe is, in fact, a sociopath. Yeah. And yeah. he shouldn't be around children. And the music cues and the way that the scene is played is leading you as the viewer to think you're seeing something that you're not seeing. Yes. And then it lets you in on it mm -hmm. when his wife comes in and basically says, you two are making a mess and you realize that they're playing with squibs. And then that retroactively made me think, well, has he been doing a version of this the whole movie? Because you, I think you are absolutely right. The police show up out of nowhere Oftentimes, we 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 meet him in the con after the con has started. Right, like we don't see him. Yeah, you never see him get in, get into the con. Yeah, yeah, but again, this is him telling the story, and I'm still landing on. I don't know. I I absolutely think that there is part of this film that this is a case of the emperor has no clothes and and certainly wendell harris right place right time i, I think as you said i and, and and you and i have talked about this numerous times this moment mm -hmm. that everyone is looking for the next spike lee 
And this is a moment for this to happen. I'm not going to hold him not making a second movie against him as necessarily proof of lack of, of talent or lack because when we've talked about this, there are a lot of filmmakers from this period that never got to make a second movie for That's a lot of, enough. and That's when true. you read, I think from that same article that uh, Richard Brody wrote, the implication is that there's a lot of politics involved mm -hmm. as well with that. But there is space for that. Though. Like, I think there is space for this is, uh, you, you know, this is one of these cases of these films that the critics and the academics see, and they put all this stuff on top of. Yeah. yeah. But it's nothing really there. It's not there. Right. On the other hand, I do think if there is this other aspect to the film, you have to work too hard to get to it. Like, quite honestly, my most damning praise is what I said at the very beginning. Like, the fact that I didn't really get enough out of one viewing mm -hmm. to say, okay, blah, 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 says something about the film. Maybe it says something about me. Maybe it says something about how we are expected to view these films. But, you know, whether we're talking about something like Ganji and Hess, whether we're talking about something like, um, what was Terrence Nash's film? The, the something of, of beauty. Remember the, Terrence? oh yeah. The, uh, oversimplification, the oversimpl of, oversimplification her of her beauty. Like these, these were very difficult, challenging mm -hmm. films. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, hell, Eve's Bayou, I think, is a film that rewards rewatch after rewatch. Mm -hmm. But one, one viewing, I sit down two hours later, what you got? I don't know how much you get out of this film out of one viewing. Yeah, and like you said about the... Um, you don't see the connective tissue of like, like how he gets into the cons. Like you don't, especially considering how he comes off in the beginning of the film, you don't get any sense that this guy is a con artist because with a con artist, there is a level of intelligence that you see on that. You kind of like you see, it may not be, you know, book smarts, but there's a, there, there's a, there's a wit, there's, there's an intelligence, a street smart about them that you at least get a, a window into. And because these, these scenes happen, like you said, pretty much like, like we just dropped into the scene and all of a sudden he's a doctor, all of a sudden he's a lawyer, right? You, you don't see his intelligence coming off because he's talking to buffoons who are just ready to fill a quota. Right. You know, right. so no one comes across as a worthy adversary. Right. For him to get through. That's right. true. So without having that connective tissue, you, you need, you, you're not drawn to his side at all in this film. And it's interesting that you brought up Ganja and Hess, because I was actually going to, to reference film like Ganja and Hess and a film like The Watermelon Woman. The Watermelon, yeah. Both of those films are films that when you watch them just as a film, just on, on the production level of a film, they both might be a bit challenging for you. But the director has enough going on from a direct directorial point of view and where you can see what they're trying to do as far as like with their camera and what they, the storytelling that they're trying to show put forth on the screen as well as with the writing either the in the subtlety of the writing in both of those films and the ideas of those films in that as challenging as it is you're there for the challenge because you know that you're what there's something here and you want to be in on it and you and you're slowly it's being revealed to you so that at the end you feel like okay i watched something you know i i had a, a bit of a meal this one like you said at least for me i'm 
15, 20 minutes in and I'm like, yo, I'm, I do not like what's happening here. This is not, I'm not liking the flavor here. And I'm just, I just have to finish it because my mom said I got to eat all my peas. Right, right. And that's the only reason why I finished this film. I actually like some of the script. I actually like some of the, the, the writing in it. And, and so again, some of the playfulness mm. in the script. Now, I actually, I actually liked him a little bit, frankly. Like what I was thinking is like, there's a version of She's Gotta Have It where he plays Jamie. I could see that. Like, like you know, he's this sort of, you know, good looking guy. Like you say, has a great voice, mm -hmm. which he knows. Because mm -hmm. as you said, you hear a lot of it. But, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's. It's a movie that 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 I, I you know I think I want to watch again. Mm, wow. Like I think I want to watch it again and see if I miss something. Did you watch it with Wendy? Mm -mm. No, I just watched it. You know, I just watched it. Mm. Yeah, like, you know. Curious her thoughts on no, that. no, no. I watch it. I took notes. I no, mean, I'm you curious know, I, if, yeah. you, if on your rewatch. Yeah. Yeah, you sit her down with because yeah. I watched it with with my lady, mm -hmm. and she was on her phone. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> they don't do the podcast every week, so <laughs> they don't have the mini texts that we have to draw from. That's so. True. I um, speaking of the of of the um, script, and and Spike Lee, I, I did solve a mystery. That I've had for years. Okay. There's a um quote. There, there's a there's a quote of a scene at the beginning of Brown Skin Lady mm -hmm. off of Black Star's album. Mm -hmm. That part where where the guy's like, I like like complected women, you know, and he says, Your conditioning has been conditioned. And for years I've been trying to figure out Wait, what Spike hear. Lee film that comes because the 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 exchange had that very kind of heightened affectation that you get especially with early Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. Like I was like, is this some, is this a cut of school days that I don't remember, but it comes from this. Comes from me. So, so there you go. You've got Richard Brody, you've got Sundance, you've got the Criterion channel and you've got most deaf and Talib Kweli is black star. All support this film as well. So there you go. Okay. But would you recommend that people watch? Yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that. I knew you were going to ask me that. Do I recommend people watch this? You know, I'm always going to err on the side of yes. But this is a real soft yes. <laughs> this is a real soft yes. This is a real soft yes that might turn into a hard yes or a hard no. Mm. in a month okay when i circle back around to it okay well i listen to vincent if you want ladies and gentlemen right right but if you know like i know right right don't waste your time with chameleons don't right? waste your time with do chameleons. not waste your time the emperor chameleons. indeed has no clothes no butt ass naked butt ass naked no don't watch chameleon street all right all right before we tell you what we're going to be watching next week, ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to check out the Michaud Mission, Two Men, One Podcast. Every Black film ever made, go to MichaudMission.com where you can check out all of our past shows and you can also hit swag to check out all of the cool designs and gifts available for your buying pleasure by way of our good friends at Public, because that is the way that we keep our show free for you. Yay. You can also email us all of your thoughts and concerns to the Michaud Mission at gmail.com. Leave us a voicemail at 215-867-9666. Tell Vincent and Len what is on your mind. Ask us a question. If it's a comment, what have you. We don't, we just love to hear from the missionaries. You can follow the Michelle Mission on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Michelle Mission. Subscribe on YouTube and Twitch at Michelle Mission. And where you get your podcast, please give us a five star rating and review, especially if it's on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, because that helps people find our show. 
Next week on the Michelle Mission, it's my turn. Yes, sir. And as I am want to do and love to do, I dig into the crates. All right. And I dug back 20 years to 1969. Ooh. So since this is, you know, after World War II, it is not an old ass movie. Yes, it is just yes. merely an old movie. It's an old movie. Starring a favorite of ours here on the mission, Raymond St. Jacques. Nice. In Change of Mind. Which is different from Change of Habit with Elvis. Oh, it is totally, <laughs> totally different from Change of Habit from Elvis. Totally different. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> That's next week on the Michelle Mission. Until then, he's Vincent, I'm Len, and in parting, we say, we'll see you when it's time to meet again.